Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from OnlinePhotographyTraining.com. Welcome to my free training on On One Photo Raw 2019. In this episode, we're going to take a detailed look at the develop module that's found in the edit panel of On One Photo Raw 2019. Now we're going to work on this image here, and you can see we're in the Browse module right now. Now to get over to the Develop module, we have to go to the right-hand panel and click on this Edit panel. And when we do, we'll automatically open up in the Develop module. You can see we have the Effects module, Portrait module, and then we have Local Adjustments all next to that. Now what we're going to be talking about specifically are these four adjustments that are here in the Develop module. Tone and Color, Details, Lens Correction, and transform. And you may have noticed when I open one of these, whatever was open previously automatically closes. This type of behavior isn't by default enabled in On One Photo Raw 2019. Your version, probably right out of the box, has all these open and you'd have to scroll to them. Uh, I like this behavior. It's called solo mode. If you want to enable solo mode for these panels, Go up to the top window menu, and then right here it says solo mode. Again, if that's off, and by default that will be off, you could open all of these at once and then have to scroll between them. And I don't like it that way, so that's why I prefer to use solo mode. Now, typically we're, when you're going to process an image, we start with tone and color. More specifically, we start with tone. We want to get the tone down right away. Now. How you go about doing this is really up to you. There's really no right or wrong way. I'll show you the way I do it, and hopefully you could take a little bit of what I do and maybe a little bit of what someone else does and come up with your own way that works for you. Now, typically what I'll do is I look at an image and I figure out what's it need the most, meaning as far as tone is concerned, meaning if my image is too dark, then it needs to be brightened up. If it's too light, it needs to be taken down a little bit. If maybe the shadows are a little bit too dark, I'll open up shadows. So I look for whatever is needed the most. Now in this image, when I look at it, uh, just the shadows are a little bit dark. Maybe the highlights are a little bit bright. So I would go to the shadow slider first, and I would move that to the right. And then I would go to the highlight shadow and move that down. So I would kind of bring down the highlights a little bit, bring down the shadows a little bit. Then I go to midtones. And I'd probably move for this image, move that down a little bit, trying to just get the tone a little flatter so I could see the image a little better and decide what my next move will be. Now, in this case, usually what I like to do is I like to go to profiles. And you can see at the very top, we have camera profile. Now, this will only be here on a raw file. So if you're working on a JPEG, a TIFF, a PNG, any other type of image file beside a raw file, this won't be here at all. What you have to remember is a raw file technically isn't an image file. It's really <clears throat> a data file. And really every pixel from the sensor, the data is taken from those pixels and recorded in the raw file. Well, when you view that image on the back of your computer or a back of your um, camera, your camera has to interpret all those pixels. It interprets the tone and color and contrast of those pixels, that data and it will render an image for you. And there's a lot of different renderings it can do. Similarly, if you're viewing a raw file on a computer using an application such as On One Photo Raw 2019, that application has to look at each of those pixels, the data from each of those pixels, and it has to interpret that data and render an image for you to view. And there's different profiles it will use. It just how it interprets those pixels and renders tone, color, and contrast. And you can see right off the bat, it will have these on one profiles. So these are the uh, profiles that are built into on one. And by default, it uses on one standard. And if you hover over the other ones, you'll see the tone, the color, and the contrast of each, uh, you know, of the image will change slightly when I hover over any of the other choices. 
Some are very subtle. There's a little more difference between neutral, let's say, and vivid. Now below that, we have the actual camera profiles. These are the actual profiles that are inside of the camera. And this will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. I happen to take this image with a Sony camera. So these are the profiles that were in that Sony camera. This will even maybe vary from camera make or camera model to model. So you could be using one model Sony and it will say specific profiles or you'll be presented with specific camera profiles and a different model Sony camera will have different profiles. Now in this case here, um, I'm going to go with, let's go with, uh, doesn't really matter that much. Let's go with on one vivid. I kind of like that one. So again, you could just pick the profile though early in your processing workflow because that kind of gives you the base of what you're processing. So in this case, I chose on one vivid. Typically, you could do that right away, then come in and do highlights, midtones, and shadows. Uh, I chose to do those first, and then I'll come in and readjust this a little bit. So I have the tone now set for my image, almost. Next, I need to get a white and black point and you do that with the whites and blacks slider now you could just eyeball it you could move your your sliders around a better way in my opinion to do it is to hold the j key in while you're doing this now this will only work if you're in the levels you have levels showing up here or info showing up here it doesn't work when the navigation window is showing i'm not sure if that's a bug or if that's just the way uh, on one built the program. So we'll go to whites. I'm going to hold the J key in and adjust the white slider to the right. Now you'll notice sometimes you might have to hit the J key a couple times for it to work. Uh, I think that's a bug. Anyway, you'll notice though as I move it to the right while I'm holding this J key in, we're starting to get red come through on the image. That red is indicate that indicating that we're clipping. Specifically, we're clipping the highlights. When you're clipping highlights, in this case, that means there's no detail there at all. You just kind of wiped out the detail because you made it so bright. So what you'd like to do normally is not have any clipping. So hold that J key in and then adjust the whites slider until the red is either almost completely gone or completely gone. I like it to be completely gone. A lot of people have different ways they do it. They like Some people like to have a little bit of clipping. Some like no clipping at all. In my case, I don't like the whites to clip at all or the highlights to clip at all. Next, you'll do the same thing for blacks. You'll hold that J key in and adjust the, uh, adjust the black slider. And this time you'll see blue come through. That means we're crushing the shadows. When you crush shadows, that means you're making them absolutely black, no detail there at all. So if you would print this and you had blown out highlights and you had crushed blacks and you printed it, that means in the highlight area, no ink would be put down on the paper at all in the shadows area the blacks area it would just be straight black no detail at all now typically personally I like to clip the black a little bit so I'll have a little bit of blue coming through to me that just adds a little more tonal depth to the image I that's the way I do it I encourage you to work on something or a, a way that works for you and uh, really expresses your style so now I really have tone totally adjusted. Now one quick note about holding that J key in. I mentioned that sometimes you'll hold it in, it doesn't seem to do anything, and you'll have to let go and then push it in again. You may find at times that it won't go away. <laughs> Meaning you're holding that J key in and you're adjusting, let's say, whites, and you have that red there, and then you let go of the J key, and it stays there. If that's the case, if you go to levels and you look at the histogram, you'll notice in the corners there's these very faint little up arrows. If you click on those, and this is a little bit wonky too, sometimes you'll have to click on them a few times, you'll get this locked on. So it's, more, it's like you're holding the J key in permanently. So there will always be showing. Now I could come in here and adjust these whites more properly. But you could see though, it's still activated. You could see the blue is through here and you could hit the J key and it won't always do something. It sometimes gets locked on. If it does, just click on these little triangles again and you'll turn it off. It's a little bit um, 
I, if for lack of a better word, in my opinion, it's a little bit buggy in that regard. So we have the tone adjusted now. We adjusted tone by picking a profile and adjusting these sliders. I could come in and add some contrast to the image. That, of course, affects tone, but will affect contrast. Well, I add some structure to the image. I'll go to the right. Kind of brings out a little more detail in the sky area. I got that really high. That's like around 67. That's very high. Now, haze. If I want to add haze to the image, go to the right. If I want to kind of remove haze and add a little more detail to the sky, I can move to the left. You got to be careful, though, because you really start to really make the blacks or the shadow areas look almost fake. So you really have to be careful with this sli uh, haze slider. If you're looking at the sky, you're going, wow, that looks awesome. But then you start looking over here and it doesn't look so awesome anymore. So you got to be careful with that one. Go right around there. So now we really have tone completely done. Next is color. And we go down to the color. There's a lot of different ways you could adjust white balance. Um, you could adjust it so it's exactly like you saw it when you were there. Or you could make it maybe a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler uh, for aesthetic reasons. A lot of different ways you could do this. The first way, especially if you want to make the image look like it was, the scene was when you looked at it, is grab this little eyedropper by clicking on the eyedropper. And when you do, you'll see that it becomes active and your cursor becomes a plus sign. Now what you really want to find is something in the scene that is gray, preferably 18% gray. So find like a gray cloud and click in this case and click on it and it will adjust the temperature and tint sliders to best uh, give you a correct white balance for the scene. If you don't like it, click on that little eyedropper again and click somewhere else. And you can keep doing that until you feel you have a white balance that is acceptable to you. Another way you could adjust white balance is you could go directly to the temperature and tint sliders and just move them. Another way you could do it is you could go to this auto button and just click auto and that will give you an auto white balance. But that, what that is actually doing is if you go to this drop down, you'll notice there's a lot of different choices. And these are the choices that are in your, at least some of them are the choices that are in your camera. Auto is on one, on one just kind of looking at the image and analyzing it and giving you an automatic white balance. And that's clicking there or clicking this button auto does the exact same thing. Below that are choices that are in your camera, daylight, cloudy, and you just have to hover over these and you'll get a rendering of that white balance applied to the scene. Shade, tungsten, fluorescent, flash, and then custom, it will show custom whenever you manually come in and move any sliders or you get the eyedropper and click on a, something somewhere. Now in this case here, let's just, um, Let's go with auto. And again, you could manually come in and adjust the sliders. Also, if you prefer, you could, where this little uh, K is, that's in Kelvin. So you could click there. And if you click there, you'll get a Kelvin reading right here. And you could come in here and you could actually type in a Kelvin reading. So if you want the image cooler, you would pick like a higher number, like 7,000. Right? Or no, that's warmer, I'm sorry. And if you want it cooler, then you would pick a lower number like 3000. Like that. And where this comes in handy is if you're in a studio situation and you're using strobes and your strobes are rated at putting out a color temperature of 5200 Kelvin. Well, then you could, let's say, type in 5200 there and that will give you the right um, color temperature for the strobes you're using. Now, in this case, I mentioned, I think I'm just going to use, let's see what auto looks like. Let's see what daylight looks like. Let's just go with daylight because it was daylight. So there. Now, sometimes when you do adjust your white balance, you'll find that you might have to come back in and readjust some of the tones uh, if, in your image. Sometimes you could just to look at the histogram. You don't have to hold in the J key. Just kind of eyeball it. I kind of like that. So I have the tone. I have the color adjusted to a point. I still need to adjust saturation and vibrance. Um, saturation will affect every single pixel in your image. If you move it to the right, it's just going to enhance the saturation of those pi pixels. If you move it to the left, it's going to suck some of the color out. 
all the way to the left, it takes the color completely out because it's affecting every single pixel. If you're, you have colors near saturation and you move the saturation slider to the right, it will oversaturate those colors. Vibrance, on the other hand, is a little more um, subtle. It does not oversaturate or it will tend not to oversaturate a color. So if you move vibrance to the right, it will bring a color to saturation but not oversaturate it. Also, if you move it to the left, it tends to not take all the color, although in this image, which isn't a very colorful image, it does take all the color out. But it will tend to not affect the pixels as heavily. Also, vibrance doesn't affect skin tones, lighter skin tones as much. So pinks, reds, it doesn't affect those colors as much. So if you have a portrait and you want to bring out the color of the person's clothing and maybe the color of the surroundings, you would be better, uh, a better choice would be to move the vibrant slider because it won't affect their skin tone as much. If it does seem to affect their skin tone, you could then click this little button here and then that will further reduce the effect of vibrance on lighter skin tones. All right, now in this image, I don't have a person in it, so I'm gonna just push saturation up quite a bit. Now purity, we have highlights and shadows. Sometimes you'll find that when you do um, a white balance adjustment and you adjust either saturation and or vibrance, that the highlights and or the shadows get kind of tinted that color. And you could remove that with these purity sliders. So you move it to the right, and what it's actually doing though it's, it's in this case with the highlight slider, it's making the highlights black and white. And similarly, if I move shadows to the right, it takes that color out of the shadows. So you must use these sliders very judiciously because it's actually going to be sucking all the color out. It doesn't just remove that tint, tinted color that you applied or that you got there when you adjusted white balance, whatever. It really takes all the color right out. So be careful with those two sliders. So I think that's good as far as the tone and color um, panel is concerned. Next is details. Now I mentioned in past videos, I prefer to add sharpening and noise reduction with the effects module because with the effects module, you're supplied a mask. So with the mask, you could apply sharpening to a very specific part of your image or apply noise reduction to a very sp specific part of your image. With the details, tab in the develop module it's you it's like all everything you're going to affect the entire image now going across the top you have uh, some presets we have low it adds a low what they consider a low amount of sharpening a low amount of luminance noise reduction and a low amount of color noise reduction high obviously moves those sliders further to the right if you go under the more drop down you can see there's a couple more under there there's print this is if you're going to print the image this adds an amount of sharpening and noise reduction, which should work well with most prints. Drop down again, you can see there's one called screen. That's if you're just sharing this online and people are going to be viewing it on a monitor, then you have this amount here. You can, of course, come in and adjust these individually. You could reset any of these panels with this little semicircular arrow right there. So then you could come in and adjust these. Typically, what you want to do is zoom in. So click on the image to zoom in. Um, look, now there's not a lot of noise. Usually what I like to do and what most photographers like to do, we like to remove noise first. Because a lot of times when you sharpen, if you didn't remove noise already, you're going to be sharpening the noise. And it makes it a little more difficult to uh, get rid of in the final image. In the case of on one, since these are in the same tab, they kind of work hand in hand. So it's not as important to do luminance or color noise reduction first, but I still out of habit do it. Now in this case, this image doesn't have barely any noise, but I would just move it to the right till I see the noise dissipate, which is, I'm sure you're barely seeing it, if seeing it at all on the video, but really right around 14, 15, it's really obliterated the noise. Now if you find that when you did that, that you softened the detail a little bit, you could bring back some of the detail with the detail slider, move that to the right, and it will bring back some of the detail. This is gonna be very subtle. This won't do a lot in most cases. So you wanna move that to the right until the detail comes back, but you're not starting to bring any of the noise back. 
Then we have color noise reduction. This image doesn't have any color noise. Typically that uh, will be red, green, and blue dots on the image. And you'll see it you know, when you're zoomed in. And it most often will be in the shadows. And it will most often be when you're using higher ISOs. Or an image is really underexposed. And you had to, uh, in the tone and color tab, had to move exposure to the right to really make it acceptable. Then you might find that you have a lot of color noise. If you do, similarly, just move that to the right till it's gone. If it obliterated a lot of the detail when you did that, then take the detail slider and move that to the right. Now in this case here, we don't have any color noise at all. Next, I would go to sharpening and I would move that to the right. Uh, what I'm doing is I want to make sure I'm sharpening, making it like in this case, I'm looking at the uh, bricks here, the mortar between the bricks making sure it's nicely defined. I want to make sure, though, that I'm not making um, uh, it so sharp that we're starting to get haloing. We're around objects such as this that are darker with a lighter background where it starts like bleeding dark kind of around it. If you do, then back that down. Threshold um, actually is, well, it's enhancing the sharpening even more. And um, it's allowing more parts of the image to get sharpened. Like where does the threshold, where's the threshold point where sharpening begins and sharpening ends? And if you move it to the right, you're going to be making it even sharper is the bottom line. So be careful with that because that will cause the haloing. Then when you're ready, just zoom back out. Now again, I prefer to do sharpening and noise reduction in the effects tab. And when we get to that in future videos, I'll go into very... Um, a lot of detail on how I do it. Now, after that, we go to lens correction. You can see that I shot this with the Sony camera and it found the Sony lens. There is an option in On One Photo Raw 2019, so it will automatically apply um, lens corrections to an image. Um, to make sure that's turned on, go up to the Preferences tab. In a Mac, it's under On One Photo Raw. On a Windows computer, it's under Edit. So go to Preferences, and then go to where it says Files, the second tab from the left. And right here, the second checkbox from the bottom, it says Apply Lens Corrections Automatically to Raw Photos. So make sure that's checked, and then your lens corrections will be automatically applied. If for some reason it didn't find the lens, you could go and drill down. So you, the make a lens you're using, in this case it was a Sony, then you could click the exact lens and then you would go through the list and find the lens that you used. And then it will apply the lens corrections and you can see there's before and there's after. So it, it definitely applied a lens correction. Now if it didn't find your lens, if your lens isn't in the database, you could click this little expose arrow right here. And you could come in here and manually try to adjust this. Um, really, you're doing it by eye. So you're going to be looking for uh, fringes of color on edges, and you could get rid of either purple or green, uh, which is the most common what you'd see. That's the chromatic aberration of the lens. Also, if you have pincushion or barrel distortion, you would get rid of it with the distortion slider uh, right there. And fall off. This is like vignetting that you're getting uh, in the corner. So if you have a, like dark vignetting, you would move this to the right to get rid of it. Uh, you could also, it may not be even, so you can move the midpoint around also. Now in the case, hopefully it found your uh, lens automatically. And I should add, by the way, if it didn't find your lens, you could try clicking the auto button here and hopefully it will automatically find the lens for you. So that's really lens correction. It's actually pretty simple and it works very well. So in this case, it, I didn't have to do anything here. It found my lens automatically. Now, the transform tab we touched on in the very first episode where I had an image of a building that was keystoned a little bit and was falling backwards. Remember that? Um, there's a lot you could do with this tab. First of all, by default, it's going to be off. So you have to turn it on by clicking on that little box there. And we talked, we, in that video, I did keystoning where we had this box and we move it uh, so that these lines um, go along a vertical spot and a horizontal spot, uh, two spots on the image, and then click apply and it would apply then that to the image. This image doesn't have that issue. 
What you most often will do this is when you have a crooked image. Now this image isn't crooked, but I'm going to demo it anyway. If you go to level right here and click there to make that active, you'll see your cursor turns into this little arrow and level. What you want to do is find something that should be either perfectly horizontal in the scene or perfectly vertical in the scene. And you're going to draw a line along that line that's in the scene. In this case, usually with a landscape image, if you have part of the horizon showing, that should be perfectly horizontal. So in this case here, like the edge of the water, I would just go right here and click and hold in the left mouse button and then draw this line. You probably can't see it. I can barely see it. And draw this line so it's perfectly horizontal along that water line. And then let go of the left mouse button and it will automatically straighten your image. And you can see it did straighten it slightly. And you can see there's a little bit of uh, blank pixels over here. If you have blank pixels, as I demonstrated in the, um, in the uh, first video, when you do either the keystone adjustment, even this level adjustment, then you should crop the image. You would go to the crop tool. And I want to crop this image either, uh, anyway because I don't think it's that strong of a composition. I want to make it more rule of thirds. So I go, first of all, up here to the top and make sure that I'm in the original ratio. I don't want to do freeform. By default, it will often say freeform up here. So I want to go to 2 to 3 because that's the original ratio. I'll grab from this corner and I'll just pull up. So I want the lighthouse right on the rule of thirds. And I want the horizon of, of this uh, land right along that bottom third. So about like that. That tightens it up pretty much. I could maybe go a little more like this. And then I could push that image up like that. And then when, I'm, uh, when I like the crop, click Apply. Now i got to make sure it got rid of those blank pixels over there. I should probably bring it in over there just to touch. And just like that. And then when we're done over here where it says Apply, click Apply. And then it applied our crop to the image. Now, you can, if... Keystoning or leveling uh, doesn't work. You could go to the sliders and you could just, you know, there's when you have the image uh, buildings falling backwards, you would do that vertical. Similarly with horizontal, it kind of tilts it left or right like that. Rotation is for straightening the image. Uh, so we could, you know, straighten the image. And you could see that I have a grid that's appearing whenever I click on any of these sliders. It's a 5% grid. You could change it to a 1% grid. So it's even tighter or looser grid, you know, 10, 5, or 1, or no grid at all. So you won't have any grid when you do that. And I'll reset that. Now you could scale the image in if you need to. That will help you get rid of blank pixels. Sometimes if you're using the keystone or the level tool, you could just, uh, just do that scale slider to the right. Um, aspect ratio, when you do this, it kind of stretches the image out left or vertically and horizontally. Then we have the shift and rise. And this is the same thing as this move over here on the right. So if you're going to shift the image to the right, shift it to the left, you're actually moving the image, or you're moving it up or down with that one. You also could click right here. Your cursor turns into the hand tool, and you could drag it around similarly. And you can see those sliders move as I do that. So. That's pretty much everything you need to know in the transform module. And, you know, usually what I found for me is the develop module adjustments, these four tabs, don't really get me done. I, I usually have to go into effects to finish the image. You may find, though, like in this image, I don't consider this image done. You may find, though, that um, for a lot of images, the develop module is all you need, and you could get in and out relatively quickly and process an image. So this video is going to end here. In our next video, I'm going to go over a lot of the tools that are over here on the left. I touched on the crop tool already in a couple different videos, but we didn't talk about especially the local adjustments. Like, for instance, way off here in the distance, we have a couple birds. And I know they're birds, you know they're birds, but if we print this, quite often when the ink gets soaked into the paper a little bit, those just look like specks of dirt. So we need to get rid of those. And there's other things we probably want to uh, use a tool over here on the left-hand panel, 
uh, for our image, maybe a graduated filter or maybe brush in an adjustment here or there. And we're going to cover that in the next video. Thank you for watching my free video training on On One Photo Raw 2019. Please do me a favor and like and share this video. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And in the description below this video, you'll see ways that you could help me keep making free photography how-to videos. Finally, visit my website, onlinephotographytraining.com. There, you'll find over 900 videos and articles to help you with your photography. And of course, they're all free. Thank you.